Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here tonight. Should be a lovely late night conversation, just like we always have here. A lovely late night conversation. So hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. It is going to be just downright awesome. Just downright awesome. So welcome, everybody. It's going to be great. Um, good times. Let's roll the opening credits. ...of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just, it's just a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. All right, folks, folks, what has happened? What has happened lately? Well, before we get into that, I'll give you the quick lowdown on how we do it. First of all, I'm wearing the amazing shirt that was sent to me by the great David Fox. So thank you, David, if you're watching. Much appreciated for the shirt. Thank you very much, David Fox. And what's happening? What's happening in the world? Well, uh, the way we do these lives is first I give my opening remarks. Um, my opening remarks are then followed by the roll call where I call people out as I see them, names and locations, names and locations. We find out who it is on the other side of the uh, of the camera who's watching. And then after that, I answer your super chat questions. I answer your super chat questions. That's how we roll. So if you have something you want me to speak about in the second half of our show, by all means, shoot me a super chat. It's all up to you how long the second half of the show goes. Sometimes we have really long sessions because I have, a, I have a lot of really, really good Super Chats to answer. Other times it goes by really fast. Lately, we've had pretty short uh, Q&A sessions. That's okay. Um, but if there's something you want me to answer, by all means, a Super Chat is the way to do it. Tonight, our amazing volunteer and good friend and CPI member Don D from NYC will be writing down your Super Chats so while I will put them on the screen to acknowledge that they've been here, I will not have to interrupt my ramblings and ravings uh, in order to write your super chat down. So it'll go very, very, very smoothly. So um, yeah, it should be great. So if there's something you want me to talk about, a uh, question you want me to answer, something you want me to comment on in the second half of the show, just shoot me a super chat and it will be put on the list. And that is how we roll. So welcome, everybody. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notifications bell. We are now going to have a great show. So what's what's in the news lately, folks? What is in the news? Um, and thank you for once again for this amazing shirt, David. I'm wearing the shirt you gave me. Proud to be Union. Great stuff. Love it. Um, good stuff. And very, very good. Um, very, very good. And since we're we're on here, um, might be worth talking about the the various issues that uh, people on these lives, um, you know, are concerned about. And you know, I mean, let's talk about a few things that might be of some relevance here. Um, one one thing uh, that's worth noting uh, is that. Uh, Jackson Hinkle was today banned from both PayPal and Venmo, another act of vicious censorship. Jackson Hinkle is an amazing content creator, uh, you know, anti-imperialist, populist, working class, Medicare for all, friend of Jimmy Dore, and uh, he was banned from PayPal and Venmo. Just like we got banned from PayPal, PayPal shut us down as well. Now they have banned Jackson Hinkle from Venmo. Uh, another act of vicious censorship that we should oppose. What else? The Summit of the Americas has taken place, has started. 
Uh, this is the USA having a meeting of the different countries on the American hemisphere, North, South, and Central America. And they excluded Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. And as a result, uh, Mexico boycotted and refused to attend out of protest. In addition to that, uh, there's a couple mercenaries, individuals uh, from the United Kingdom and from Poland who went to Ukraine to fight on behalf of the Ukrainian fascists to fight against the Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, they have been arrested and sentenced to death um, by the Donetsk People's Republic. Um, and um, so you have that also. That's quite an interesting development. Um, and then you have what the media wants you to care about. And this is what the media wants you to care about. They want you to care about the fact that they are convening more hearings and more investigations about the January 6th, uh, you know, Capitol riot of Trump supporters last year. Well, if you want to know what I think about these January 6th hearings, uh, you can go back to there's an old, old folk song. Uh, it's from the South. Uh, it was, I think, sometimes it's called the blue tail fly. Other times it's called Jimmy crack corn. It goes like this, Jimmy crack corn. And I don't care. Jimmy crack corn. And I don't care. Jimmy crack corn. And I don't care. And I don't care. I really, really don't care about these January 6th hearings. Look, yes, January 6th was awful. I don't condone that kind of behavior. No one should be going into the Capitol building and, uh, you know, uh, you know, farting in Nancy Pelosi's chair or urinating in people's offices. No one should be, uh, you know, threatening members of Congress. Not acceptable. Um, but at the end of the day, this act of trespassing and vandalism, which was very much allowed to happen by the government, um, you know, the government, you know, let them in. Now, I, everyone kind of agrees about January 6th that they were let in. Some people think they were let in because the government is all working for Trump and this was an attempted coup. Some people think they were let in because this was all a setup to frame Trump supporters. But everyone seems to agree they were let in. And as someone who's been to many protests in Washington, D.C., I can tell you at most protests that take place in Washington, D.C., a crowd of people can't just walk into the Capitol building. So it's pretty clear that one way or another they were let in. Um, but regardless, I really don't care. I really don't care. I mean, we should pay attention to these developments when the capitalists fight with one another, we should be concerned about it and see potential openings for the working class. But this is the this is the process of capitalism and decay. This is what's called Bonapartism, when sections of the ruling class battle against each other and they battle against each other, all hoping that they can seize control of the state and use the state, the government, to stabilize the capitalist economy when the rate of profit is dropping, when unemployment is rising, when the capitalist economy is unstable, when there begins to be unrest in society, the capitalists will begin to fight among each other and scramble for control of the government. And Karl Marx observed this directly in 1851 when he was living in Paris. And in Paris, they had the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon's grandson, or Napoleon's nephew, I believe. Napoleon III carried out his coup and took control of the government and used the French government to try and stabilize capitalism. And then in the 1930s, we saw the rise of Adolf Hitler and fascism in Germany. We also saw the rise of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt in the United States. And there were many, many attempts to keep society stable. Bonapartism, one faction of the ruling class seizing control of the government and using the heavy hand of the state to stabilize society. Sometimes they do it in a kind of mildly progressive way, like Roosevelt or like Louis Bonaparte. Other times they do it in a brutal reactionary way, like Hitler, like Mussolini. But regardless, this is what tends to happen in a capitalist crisis. And it never works. It never works. Louis Bonaparte took control of France, but by 1871, the French government had collapsed. You had the Paris Commune of 1871. It didn't work. And Hitler, Hitler, you know, yes, took power in 1933, took some dramatic moves in 1934 to stabilize the economy. But by 1939, World War II had broken out because they were still in an economic rut. Their economic dramatic moves didn't work, and they were forced to go to war and launch a war in order to keep their economy going. 
and that led to World War II, and that didn't work. And Roosevelt, the same for Roosevelt. You know, Roosevelt took some dramatic economic reforms that certainly made people's lives better and 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 eased the suffering of the Great Depression. But ultimately, uh, you know, it only led to the Second World War. And after the Second World War, the U.S. economy only got going again because the rest of the world had been blown up, and almost every other country uh, in the Western world had had suffered as a result of World War II, had been devastated. The United States was at the center to rebuild the world economy and only mass destruction could save capitalism. These things, these things, these things are mechanisms that capitalists take in order to try and save their system. And this is what happens as in one of my favorite songs by Cornelius Cardew, I listen to Cornelius Cardew ironically, mind you. Cornelius Cardew is a communist musician. He was an experimental composer in the 1960s, and he became a Maoist and later a follower of Enver Hoxha in Albania. And he started writing what he called people's liberation music. And it's a little bit hokey, and I, I laugh at it. I listen to Cornelius Cardew with my tongue in my cheek. I'm kind of laughing at myself because it's very nerdy communist lyrics. He tried to use his songs to make communist political points. Um, but many of his songs, I enjoy them because they're kind of hokey, uh, but they're also making communist political points. He has many different songs. One of his songs is called The Lords of Labor. It's about the Labor Party. And one of the verses that I've quoted, I quoted at the beginning of the Bread Tube book, Cornelius Cardew says, the capitalists fight with one another to corner the market and divide up the world. Their quests for maximum profits are the cause of war that puts us on the dole. Their greed leads them into a crisis, which they try to resolve with a more fascist state. But our struggles against the whole capitalist system, so strike out the fascists as well as the cuts. And what he's referring to, what he's referring to is the natural process of capitalist decay. And I want to talk about that on these streams here, but I want to talk about it because it actually is something that I realized, I was having a conversation with a friend today. I realized that, that understanding this, understanding the process of capitalist decay and witnessing it is probably the reason that I am still a Marxist. I realized that there was a point in my life where I was starting to slip away from Marxism. Believe it or not, Caleb, who's obsessed, talks about nothing but communism. I was starting to slip away from Marxism, but then it was understanding this aspect of it that got me to go all in. And yes, I'm going to tell a little bit of my own story here. And that's, that's something you're not supposed to do, right? People are like, that's very egotistical. Don't talk about yourself, Caleb. No, but I'm doing it because I want you to think about yourself. In order to effectively look outward, you have to look inward. In order to be able to do good political work and connect with other people, you have to understand your own motivations. In order to understand other people's motivations, in order to effectively communicate with other people, in order, in order to be able to convince people of your ideas, in order to motivate people to take action, you must understand your own actions. And a lot of us go through life completely unaware of why we do things, right? We have all kinds of motivations that we don't think about. We have all kinds of feelings and desires that we don't understand. We go through life and we know we want to do this. We know we want to do that. We know we don't like this. We don't like that. But we don't know why. And if you want to be an effective political organizer, you have to be able to understand people's motivations, why they want to do things, and how can you appeal to those motivations, and how can you try and win people to act in their ultimate interest? And why do people act a certain way? And how is it that people are manipulated to not see their own interests? And in order to do that, you have to understand your own motivations. If you can't understand your own motivations, if you can't understand your own actions and why you take them, you'll never be able to understand other people's actions and why they take them. So as I tell you here, about how it is that I came to understand the process of capitalism and decay. Um, I'm not doing it because I want you to like, you know, I, I think I'm a legend in my own mind and I'm being narcissistic. I'm doing it because I want you to look into your mind and come to understand why you took the actions that you took. 
And based on that, understand how to convince other people, right? And that's, th these kind of things are very, very important, right? It, you know, one of the most important conversations that we have and upcoming at the retreat that we're going to do in Kansas, we will definitely be having this conversation. When I meet people that are members of CPI, that are new, I always ask them, how did you become a communist? What made you want to become a communist, right? And people will often give me answers. And that is a really interesting conversation to me because, my God, if in this society with reactionary propaganda everywhere where communist groups are irrelevant and, and then the communist groups that are out there are completely nuts and not like CPI, why? why? Why become a communist? So whenever I meet somebody and I ask them why they become a communist, I want to hear the answer. And you need to a answer that. A lot of times I'll meet somebody, I'll say, why did you become a communist? And they'll say, well, you know, uh, I, I saw that there was so much injustice in society and then I read about, and it's like, that's not the truth. No, I'm not, I'm not asking you to give me a persuasive argument. I'm not asking you what arguments you found persuasive about why you're a communist. I'm asking you, why did you become a communist? And some people will go, okay, I'll do that. And some people won't, you know, great story. There's a boomer that I knew years ago, years ago, haven't talked to them in years, but they were a boomer. And I asked them, how did you become a communist? And they said to me, oh, well, I became a communist. Well, I, I really understood it when I first got a job and I worked in a factory and I saw how my boss was ripping me off and I realized I'm a worker and I'm exploited. Well, that was an interesting answer, but it was bullshit. And two years down the road, after I'd known the person for a little while longer, I found out the real reason that they had become a communist. And no, it wasn't because they'd worked in a factory and saw their boss was ripping them off. That was a script that they had learned to memorize. That was the political training they had received, right? They were in the Workers' World Party. And the Workers' World Party was started by veterans of the 1930s movement, were very loyal to the labor movement, really pushed Marxist economics in a way that the new left groups didn't. And because of that, this person's political training was to, you know, if you ask them why, why did you become a communist? They would say to you, oh, because I got a job in a factory. And, but that wasn't the truth. The real reason that this person had become a communist was because when they were 14 years old, the Vietnam War was still going on. And their parents had been involved in the civil rights movement. And so they thought protesting was kind of a cool thing to do. And their parents had, had taken them to civil rights demonstrations to support Martin Luther King when they were younger. And so when they were 14 years old, there was a walkout at their school against the Vietnam War. And they were 14 years old and they went to the walkout against the Vietnam War. And at the walkout, you know, where all these high school kids had walked out of school to protest the Vietnam War. They saw a group of people at the walkout waving the flag of the Vietnamese National Liberation Front, the, the Viet Cong flag, chanting, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, the NLF is gonna win. Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, the NLF is gonna win. Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, the NLF is gonna win. And they thought, whoa, those people are badass. That is so badass. They're waving the flag of the communist fighters of Vietnam. And they went over and they met the people that were waving the flag of the Vietnamese. One side's right, one side's wrong, victory to the Viet Cong. One side's right, one side's wrong, victory to the Viet Cong. They saw this group of people that were waving the flags of, of the National Liberation Front, and they said, these are a really badass group of people. They're doing, you know, they're, they're really revolutionary. I want to I wanna get involved with them. And that's how they became a communist. Very different answer. Their motivation, they were attracted to the aesthetic of revolutionaries, of people waving the flag of the enemy in the heartland of the empire. They were attracted to walking out of school and breaking the rules. And their parents had taken them to civil rights demonstrations to support Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So they had a positive view of left-wing movements and anti-racism. So based on that, they became a communist, right? Their motivation was they had a desire to be part of a group, right? They wanted to be part of a group. They saw a group of people that looked really cool. They wanted to be part of them. They're, they had a desire to be part of a mass movement because their family had had trained them from childhood, to taking them to civil rights demonstrations, that it's it's good to be politically involved. It's good to be politically active. And that's why they became a communist. That is a real answer, right? And that first answer that they gave me about, oh, I was in a factory and my boss was ripping. That's a bullshit answer. That's a bullshit answer. And now I understood the real answer, right? And, and 
that's the kind of conversation you need to have to yourself. Why are you watching this live right now? Why, why is it that you got interested in Marxism and socialism? Why is it that you are listening to Caleb Maupin and, and learning about the Center for Political Innovation and the city building tendency? Why? Ask yourself why. Why? What motivates you? What, what within you is being fulfilled by these conversations? What is it that brings you back to watch these broadcasts and these streams? You know, and you don't have to tell me. I mean, I'd like to know. That'll help me make my content better, you know, and all that. But but at the end of the day, you should know that because once you know that, once you understand your own desires, you can then more effectively understand other people's desires. You have to look inward in order to look outward. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. We have this, this culture where some people, they say, oh, if I look inward, that's very arrogant and all that. No, you have to look inward. But you may not like what you find. And that's the danger. When you look inward and you really ask yourself, why are you doing things? Sometimes you might stumble on things you don't want to see. You might realize that some of your motivations are not as good, right? You may find motivations that you almost find embarrassing, right? You may find motivations that you find, um, you know, that, that reveal a weakness that you have. And that's okay, right? So it actually takes a lot of bravery to look inside. Right. Especially if you've got a lot of pain in your life, especially if you've got a lot of trauma. Right. Looking inward can sometimes show you pain that you're not aware of. Right. You know, so it can be it can feel very dangerous. And in some ways, it can be a very brave thing to look inward and examine your own motivations. And come to understand them. But when you do that, that will give you the ability to look outward much more effectively. It's very weird, right? It's very weird in that, you know, we think of narcissistic people as just being so obsessed with themselves, but they're not, right? People that are very narcissistic, very boastful, very arrogant, people that are a legend in their own mind, they tend to not understand their own motivations because if they did that, they would have to become aware of their flaws, right? People that are narcissistic, people that are really arrogant and all of that, they tend to not really understand their own behavior. Because with people that are very, very narcissistic, people who just, you know, you know, I had a teacher in school that was just a, rat, a crazy narcissist, right? He was so much of a narcissist. This guy taught earth science at my school. This guy was, and I, I, if there's anyone in my hometown, you know exactly who I'm talking about. It's a small town. I don't care, you know, you know, I'm not saying his name on here, but he can sue me if he wants. But there was a guy in my hometown who taught earth science and he was one of the most narcissistic motherfuckers I'd ever met. Forgive my language. And I, I this is how narcissistic he was. He was a teacher, a high school teacher. On the first day, the first day of school, of class, every year, he showed a PowerPoint presentation about all the awards he had won in his life. And click, and here I am winning the Earth Science Teacher of the Year Award. Click, and here I am, you know, when I, my, you know, the students that I did, you know, won this at the science fair. Click, and here, you know, what kind of teacher does that? The first day of class, he just, you know, he's just showing us. He's just showing us, like, look how amazing I am, right? It's, it's a cringe thing. I remember looking back on that and laughing, right? We didn't know any better. We're kids. We're, you know, high school kids. And we're just like, oh, wow, this guy must be really qualified. But that's a really narcissistic behavior, really narcissistic behavior, right? That guy, that guy had a lot to prove to somebody, right? And the more you think about this guy and his background and his life and things that have happened, the more you realize what is true for every narcissistic person is that underneath their narcissism is a huge amount of vulnerability, right? They're a hugely weak person, right? If you have to constantly reinforce how amazing you are, you're coming from a very weak place. Um, and so I, I just wanted to comment on that, right? Um, you know, uh, and um, just wanted to mention that. But anyhow, that's why it's important to become aware of your own motivations, right? looking into your own actions and motivations and political developments, examining it will enable you to engage with other people more effectively. So that is my justification for telling you what I'm about to tell you. I first got interested in politics mainly because I grew up in a very political family, 
you know, my parents were always talking politics in the household. We were the only Democrats in the town I grew up in. The town I grew up in were almost all Republicans. My family were Democrats. They were liberals. My mother's very religious. My father is not as religious. And, you know, it was a little town. But most of the people that I grew up around were evangelical Christians, Republicans, and conservatives. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, you know, I kind of felt like I was the odd one out, right? You know, um, you know, we, I was told basically not to talk about the politics that I heard at home because people in the area were just so conservative. And that was all well and good. And I started getting vaguely interested in socialism, vaguely interested in socialism, you know, simply because I thought it was like a more utopian way of doing things. It seemed like common sense. You know, these big corporations are driving down wages. My mother went on strike as a librarian. I walked the picket lines with my mother and, and I learned about the labor movement. It seemed like these big corporations are constantly working to drive workers' wages down and maximize their own profits. And my dad was an environmentalist. It seemed like these, these corporations are constantly polluting the environment to try and make more profits. Maybe instead of having profits run the economy, we ought to have an economy, you know, organized to serve the people, or we ought to have you know, a system where, you know, you know, the, the wealth is shared or I, I just vague ideas, not even fully socialist ideas, but I was vaguely interested in socialism. But then 9-11 happened. 9-11, September 11th happened. And after 9-11, it, you know, the whole United States went nuts after 9-11, right? There were flags everywhere. And they were, you know, George W. Bush said, you are with us or you're with the terrorists. And the whole country was just whipped up into this crazy hysteria. And it was very scary to me because I was in this little town and everyone in the town practically were Republicans and evangelical Christians. And my family were Democrats. And I felt very alienated from it. I felt very afraid. Um, you know, my family, we had hosted a student from Pakistan. We'd like been a, a you know, a host student to a, a host family to a student from Pakistan. Uh, you know, who, you know, he, he, you know, had come from Pakistan to study in a nearby liberal arts college. We'd hosted him. And in my little town, people started saying, oh my God, did you hear that Caleb and his family are friends with a Muslim? A Muslim. I wonder if they're terrorists. Cause I mean, anyone who knows a Muslim must be a terrorist. You know, this is the kind of bigoted, small-minded things people say in little towns, right? And, uh, you know, I was interested in things, right? I was interested in 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 things. And people, you know, I, I remember in, in my town, a lot of these evangelicals would say things like, did you know there's actually a church of Satan? So I remember I went to the public library and I got the S volume of the World's Book Encyclopedia. I opened it up and I read about Satanism. And I'd say, well, yes, actually there is a church of Satan, but they don't actually believe in Satan. They follow the teachings of Anton LaVey, who's this philosopher who believes that there is no morality. And they'd be like, oh my God, you researched Satanism? Why would you look into that? Oh my God. You know, it was like, I was, I always wanted to know more. I always wanted to know more. And I was afraid of the atmosphere that everyone was whipped up into with this hysteria, you know, uh, you know, this, this, anti-Islamic, pro-military, pro-war hysteria. It made me uncomfortable. And in my alienation, I started to go down the left rabbit hole. And I read Noam Chomsky. And I read Howard Zinn. And I read Ward Churchill. Ward Churchill. Fox News went after Ward Churchill, the Native American scholar. And so I read Ward Churchill. I figured, hey, if Bush and the Fox News people hate him, he must be good. And I learned all about U.S. regime change operations and crimes against the indigenous people. And, and I became very, very convinced that uh, the USA had been vicious to the Iraqi people. It had, you know, been involved in various attempts to overthrow their government. It had put sanctions on Iraq that killed half a million children. And then the USA invaded Iraq. And I said that the Iraqis were right and the Americans were wrong. And I very much started to kind of identify with the history of the Vietnam War protest movement. I thought, I read about how back in the 1960s, there were people waving the flag of the Vietnamese and waving, you know, ho, 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 chi man. And I said, well, that's what we need now, right? The Iraqis are right. The American imperialists are wrong. That was my attitude. The USA had no justification for invading Iraq. Iraq was not involved in 9-11. Osama bin Laden was a, it was a Wahhabi Saudi and uh, Saddam Hussein was a secular Ba'ath Arab socialist. So 
you know, it just seemed to me like the invasion of Iraq was wrong. The Iraqi people were right to fight against the invaders. That was the introduction, my introduction to politics. Um, and I was interested in communism. And the late, the biggest city near me was the city of Cleveland. Cleveland was the biggest major city. And there were a couple communist groups that were in Cleveland that, that were there. I contacted the Communist Party USA and they never called me back. Um, I think they sent me some stuff in the mail, but it had phone numbers on it that didn't work. And so I never called them back and they never called me back. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I reached out to different groups and long story short, the group that did the most to try and recruit me was a Maoist organization that shall not be named. You can probably guess who it was. There was a Maoist group that worked really hard to recruit me and they were Maoists and they were into the Black Panthers and they used the F word a lot and they were really open and in your face about communism. And they were protesting the Iraq war and they were calling George W. Bush a fascist and they were highlighting racism and police brutality. So that was the group that I, I became associated with. And I, when I was in high school, they would mail me, I'd give them 10 bucks a week and they would give me 10 copies of their paper and I would distribute them to people I knew at my high school. And they had a pretty decent newspaper back in those days. Um, and, you know, I, I started reading books about Maoism. And my goal was when I graduated from high school, I was going to become a Maoist communist. Um, so I remember, and, you know, I went to college near Cleveland. I just specifically decided to go to college near Cleveland because I wanted to be active in this Maoist communist group, right? There were some other colleges that I could have gone to, but I went to the one that was near Cleveland so I could be active in this Maoist communist group. And so I came to Cleveland and I was active in this Maoist communist group and I lived with them for a while. Um, and, um, you know, I was with them and I really tried to be a good member of this group, you know, and we worked very hard. We sold newspapers all the time, you know, every minute when I wasn't in college class or, you know, I was going someplace and selling a newspaper with them and, you know, and we built, you know, demonstrations against, against Bush and, you know, I tried my best to be a member of this group. However, I had some things they just couldn't convince me of. The first thing that they really couldn't convince me of was that, uh, you know, they said that that Stalin, you know, under Stalin, the Soviet Union had been socialist. But then after Stalin died, Khrushchev had restored capitalism. And I was like, how? How did that happen? They said that Cuba had never been socialist. It was just a you know, it was just a state capitalist revisionist country. I was like, how is that? I didn't get that. And, you know, I was always interested in learning more about different socialist countries around the world. And they dismissed them all because they hadn't been Maoists. And then the only country, the only place that they supported in Nepal, there was like a Maoist communist insurgency that they supported. Right. And so that was at least the one country that we that, that was good that we could pay attention to. And then I remember Nepal won. The Nepali communists won. And then they denounced them. And then they said, oh, they're not real communists. And then they denounced Nepal. So I'm like, these people are completely cut off from the real revolutionary movements around the world. That I didn't like. The other thing that I didn't like was that, uh, that you know, my whole feeling, you know, my whole interest in becoming a communist had been based on supporting, supporting the, uh, the Iraqi people and their struggle against U.S. imperialism. But they suddenly came out with this idea. They said, well, it's two outmoded systems, Islamic fascism versus Christian fascism. And we need to bring forward the third way, the communist way. I was like, no, when there's a foreign occupier, when an imperialist power attacks and occupies a country, there's not a third way. And it, my whole motivation for becoming a communist and becoming an anti-imperialist had been based on supporting people. And I was like, no, there's not a third way. The Iraqis have the right to resist. Um, so I just, they, they couldn't convince me that the Soviet Union had restored capitalism in 1956. They just couldn't convince me of that. They couldn't convince me that, um, that, that, you know, that, um, that, that, you know, that there were no socialist countries in the world, that Cuba was no good, that, you know, that North Korea was no good, that all the socialist countries were no good. They just couldn't convince me. Uh, they really lost me when they basically threw the resistance to the United States under the bus. And, and there was a big upsurge, you know, in like, I think around 2006 or so, late 2006, around the time Saddam Hussein was executed, there was like a big upsurge in Palestinian resistance. And and I, I was just, I was very excited about the Palestinians fighting for their rights. And they're like, no, 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 the Palestinians are Islamic fascists. And I was like, no, like, 
I, 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 they weren't really anti-imperialist when it got down to it. Plus, every time when I was out selling the newspaper, I realized that when you're engaging with people about communism, which is something they made me do, and I thank them for making me do that, right? Making me go out on the street and try to sell people communist newspapers, try to convince people to be communists, really important. We should make every communist do that. That is the best education you can get, right? Is to just go out with the masses, engage with the masses about communism. And they made me do that. So I would go out and engage with the masses about communism. And when I would say things like, under communism, everyone will have a job. Under communism, we'll guarantee everyone health care. The masses seem to want to hear this. But the group I was with said, oh, you can't talk that way. That's economism. And I'm like, what? That's what the whole thing is. No, 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 no. That's economism. We don't we don't talk about everyone will have jobs and everyone will have health care. No, 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 no. We don't say that. You know, oh, you know, that's economism. you got to talk about the government is oppressive. You got to talk about how imperialism is killing people around the world. We don't talk about jobs and health care for the American people. So, you know, I, they just couldn't convince me, basically. Um, you know, and as much as I tried, I really wanted to be a good, loyal member of this group. I just they just couldn't convince me. So. Because of that, because of that situation and because they couldn't convince me, I was looking for another group and I found the Workers World Party. In 2007, January of 2007, I applied to join the Workers' World Party. And in work in Cleveland, the Workers' World Party was like four people. And it was four people, and they they did pro they protested. They went to protests and stuff. And I joined them. And there wasn't a lot going on. Let me just put it that way. You know, and they weren't really doing very much. You know, it was, you know, protest here, protest there. And I was like their most active member and like they'd have national meetings in New York and, um, you know, they would call me on the phone. These older members, these boomer members would call me on the phone and be like, hey, you know, there's a national meeting happening this weekend in New York. Can we buy you a bus ticket and send to you in New York? And I'd say, absolutely. You know, I'm a college kid. You're giving me an opportunity to go to New York City for the weekend. Um, and they were like, oh, thank goodness. We don't have to go. All right. Have fun. You know, and and like I was just really wanting to be involved in this group. There wasn't much going on. There really wasn't much going on uh, in the organization. They weren't really doing very much. And, you know, the Iraq war was still an issue. And so there were Iraq war protests going on. But this group didn't really have much going on. And so, you know, I started dating somebody on my college campus. And I still went to a meeting here and there. And I was still really excited about communism. But, you know, I was thinking, OK, you know, I'll go to college, get a degree. You know, maybe I'll try to be a professor or something like that. I, you know, not much was going on. And, you know, there was some interpersonal drama. They didn't like my girlfriend. My girlfriend didn't like them. It was kind of a shitty relationship I was in in college. And, you know, it was just, you know, they were protesting the Iraq war and I was against the Iraq war. But, you know, I, I was just basically, I was really not very active. And I just started to just, you know, I was making friends on my college campus that were my age. And I I don't know, I was just starting to not feel it so much. And, you know, uh, that's what happened. And uh, Barack, o well, I, I, let me back up. Barack Obama, Barack Obama was running for president and I was trying to get the organization I was in to be more active and trying to do more with them. And they didn't seem to want to do more. And there didn't seem to be much for this group to do with me. They were a bunch of tired kind of burnouts. And, you know, I was against the war in Iraq. And, you know, and I had this girlfriend and I would go to meetings. And, and you know, it was just kind of, I was just kind of thinking, okay, this can be my little hobby. But this group does, doesn't really have much energy. And that was that. That's where I was. That's where I was, comrades, in 2007, 2008. I was kind of like, okay, a shitty relationship, you know, not much going on here. And then you'll remember the financial crisis happened. The U.S. economy crashed. Some people saw it coming, but not many people saw it coming. The U.S. economy crashed. You know, the housing bubble burst. 
Wall Street plummeted. People lost their life savings. The U.S. economy crashed. That was big. And the U.S. economy crashed. And everything started to change. For example, you know, one thing that I remember is that on my college campus, the campus college I'd went to, they had a lot of a lot of um, jobs you could get on the campus, right? You know, you, you you know, I mean, I had a job at one point where I worked at the college rec center. I was a I was a maintenance worker in the college rec center. And like this job was was a joke. You got paid ten dollars an hour, which wasn't much money. Um, but you didn't really have to work, right? You just showed up and they would like make you clean the bathroom and then you hid from the boss for the rest of your shift so they couldn't tell you something else to do and then you went home and then you clocked out and went home. I mean, it was like it was like a joke and there were a lot of jobs like that where you didn't have to do anything. You know, it was, it was a lot of just kind of easy kind of situation. U.S. economy crashed. Oh no. After that, the only jobs you could get on the campus were work-study jobs where the government was paying it. You know, they call it work-study jobs. You know, the only, I mean, you forget it. I mean, there was no jobs where you could do nothing. Um, you know, unemployment was through the roof. Um, we started seeing homeless people. I was in this like suburb of Cleveland going to college and we would see homeless people like in tents living in the woods. You know, it was like, it was insane, right? Um, you know, there were Cleveland, neighborhoods in Cleveland were dotted with empty foreclosed homes. It was like, it was a really big deal. So the U.S. economy crashed. The U.S. economy crashed, and at that point, you know, Barack Obama was elected president, and he was supposed to save the day, but the U.S. economy had crashed, and thank you, Andre. At that point, I was really worried about being able to pay my bills and have a job once I was done with college. And suddenly, there was a little bit more interest in socialism. In the mainstream, people were acknowledging that, yeah, capitalism has some problems. They were kind of trying to preempt some kind of resurgence of Marxism. But in that moment where the U.S. economy crashed, at that moment, Marxism provided the answer. And this is so, what's so important. I had been interested in Marxism because I was anti-imperialist and I was against the wars because I felt alienated from U.S. society. I'd been interested in Marxism because I wanted to be part of a group. I wanted to be part of a mass movement or something like that. But 2008, when the U.S. economy crashed, and then 2009, as the U.S. economy is in shambles, I was given a Marxist education about why that happened. And that is what ultimately won me to Marxism. I had been interested in Marxism. I've been doing Marxist activism, but it was more like new left activism, anti-imperialism. But when the financial crash happened and everything changed, suddenly, suddenly, all of society was wanting answers. And Marxism gave me the answers. Marxism gave me the answers. Marxism could explain why the U.S. economy crashed in a way that no others could. Marxism could explain the financial crash. And it was explained to me that capitalism has a built-in problem called overproduction. The worker can never buy back the product that he produces, right? The wages that the worker is paid is always a small percentage of the ultimate price of the product. The capitalist does not pay out enough wages to give the working class enough money to buy the product that he, that he sells, right? When you produce a product, you don't put into the wages of the people you paid to produce it enough that they can then turn around and buy the product they produce, right? This is the problem of overproduction. The worker can never buy back what he produces. 
when a capitalist makes a product, he has to pay the wages of the worker. He has to pay for the supplies. He has to cut into the wages of the worker to make his surplus value. And the wages the worker gets is always just a small percentage of what the product costs. But it gets worse. The capitalist is constantly working to advance technology so that he has fewer and fewer workers. And the fewer workers that he hires, the more profits that he can make, the less he has to pay in wages. I think there's a quote where the, you know, some of the capitalists said, in, in the modern economy, you don't want workers. You do everything you possibly can to not have workers. Everything you possibly can to not have workers because workers are an unnecessary cost. However, if you eliminate workers from the assembly line, if you eliminate workers from the assembly line, the worker cannot buy back the product he produces. And the more you advance technology, the more you have the market glutted with products that cannot be sold. And great economic crises tend to follow great technological leaps. The Great Depression of the 1930s was a response to the fact that Henry Ford had innovated factory production so much and made factory production so much more efficient. And as a result, there were fewer, fewer workers involved. And this is the built-in problem of capitalism. And as the capitalist reduces the role of the worker in production, you also have another problem, which is that only wage labor produces surplus value. The capitalist can't make, you know, he, his, his profits come out of the surplus value created by the worker. So the rate of profits that the worker, you know, makes for the capitalist, the tendency of the falling rate of profits also kicks in. Where the worker, the worker's reduced role results in a lower rate of profits for the capitalist. He makes a lower rate of profits on each commodity. The tendency of the rate of profit to fall. This is what Karl Marx talks about. And during the housing crisis, right, we were told why did the U.S. economy crashed. They said, well, the housing bubble burst. The housing bubble burst. Well, what, what was that about? Why The housing bubble burst. What was that going on there? Well, they'd been driving down the wages of American workers. The factory jobs had been disappearing. Living standards had been going down. The wages had been decreasing. The rate of household debt had been going up. And Americans simply couldn't afford Americans simply couldn't afford to keep buying houses the way they always had. It wasn't going to work. They couldn't afford to keep buying houses. But because the living standards of Americans, the wages of Americans were going down in response to technological leaps in capitalism, the globalized economy, deindustrialization, the reduced role of the worker at the assembly line, the American industrial working class was being decimated and reduced. Living standards were going down and Americans couldn't keep afford to buy houses. And so Alan Greenspan was at the Federal Reserve panicking, saying, how can we get Americans to keep spending money? Because if Americans don't keep spending money, the economy is going to crash. You'll recall after 9-11, George W. Bush got on national television and said, Americans, if you want to help the country, you need to go shopping, go shopping, go buy things. That's the best way to help America. And people made fun of that. They're like, wait, the country's just been hit by a national disaster and all kinds of people want to help and you're telling us to go shopping? That's what that was about. Because Alan Greenspan was telling George W. Bush, if they don't keep spending money, there's going to be an economic crash. And you'll remember, right after Bush took office, before 9-11, the economy was doing pretty badly. And then... 
suddenly things got going again. The war, 9-11, kind of kept things going for a little while longer. But the same problem built in. And so Americans couldn't keep buying houses and Americans couldn't keep running up their credit cards. It wasn't going to work. So they legalized all kinds of credit ripoff schemes to keep Americans spending money when they didn't have it because they were trying to keep the economy going. And it was like, how can we get this credit this wealth floating around the economy, how can we keep Americans buying things when they can't afford it? And so then you had the predatory lending, the mortgage ripoff scheme, but then, you know, that only worked for so long. And then pretty soon the banks ended up with a lot of empty foreclosed homes and the government was reimbursing them. They had a situation and the economy crashed and it was a disaster. And overall, Overall, the country really hasn't recovered from it. I mean, if you look at the statistics, overall, yeah, okay, unemployment isn't what it once was, but the, the rate of household debt has just increased. Living standards have continued to go down. I mean, this problem, the problems that laid the basis for the economic crisis, the problem that living standards are continuing to going down because there's no need for an industrial working class in the American heartland anymore, those problems are still alive. And Marxism explained why the economic crisis had happened. And no other school of thought could explain it. Libertarians would say, oh, if we just, you know, if the problem is the government, if we just privatized everything. And I, I knew that was a bunch of bull honky. And liberals said, oh, it was Alan Greenspan. He deregulated it. Yeah, but why did he deregulate it? He deregulated the economy because he had he was trying to solve a problem. He was trying to keep keep spending, keep people spending money because of the problem. It's the problem of capitalism. And when I read Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Frederick Engels, the last chapter, chapter three of Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Frederick Engels goes into great detail about this problem. And when I read, when I read William Z. Foster and his writings about the Great Depression, he described this very problem. Poverty amid abundance. Abundance creating poverty. Poverty amid plenty. Under capitalism. Capitalism is the only system in history where people are homeless because there are too many houses. Where people are hungry because there's too much food. We have production. Not for use, but for profit. You know, and I came up with all these neat ways of explaining this. I talked about how I went to the movies. Went to the movies one time. They asked me at the counter, at the snack counter there at the movies. They asked me, what do you want? What do you want, Caleb? And I said, well, I will take a soda. I'll take an unnamed diet beverage. And so they went to the counter and they put the ice in the soda and they put it up to that soda fountain and they filled it up and they brought me the soda. And I was thinking it would be $1, maybe one fifty. And they said, that'll be $5. And I thought, $5 for a soda? You have got to be kidding me. And I looked in my wallet and I did not have five singles. And I said, I guess I don't want it. I don't have it. So what did they do at that point? What did they do? They dumped out my soda and they threw the cup into the trash. What sense does that make? What sense does that make, right? I mean, they'd already made the drink for me. So why would they throw it in the garbage? Because they didn't make that drink so I could drink it. They made that drink so they could sell it. That's why in New York City, it's very common that restaurants at the end of the night when they throw out food they'll take motor oil and pour motor oil all over the food why do they do that that's so some homeless person doesn't take it out of the garbage because they didn't make that food so people could eat it they made that food so they could sell it production according to profit not according to social good sellability not usability that's the capitalist system And then, as I was getting this explanation, which I never got from the Maoists, the Maoists never talked about this kind of stuff. 
they kind of I, I learned some of it from reading old Communist Party USA literature from the Communist Party in the 1930s and such. But I didn't really understand it. But now, amid the economic crisis, I was starting to understand it. And then to top it all off. They explained communism to me. They explained communism to me. The Maoists that I'd been around had said, well, you know, first after the revolution, we have socialism. And eventually, socialism leads to communism. And I thought it was behaviorism. I thought, you know, we're going to be in charge and under socialism, and we're going to make people be good. And after a while, they'll just know how to be good, and then we'll have communism. I And, and then when I was explaining communism to people and trying to convince people to be communism, they're like, well, maybe socialism might be good, but communism, that'll never happen. People are always going to be greedy. People are all... You know, I didn't understand communism. I didn't understand the economics of communism. But at one of these classes I was at, somebody raised their hand and said, how could you ever have a stateless, classless world of total equality? And they answered the question. Communism is based on vast material abundance. Communism is a post-scarcity world. Communism is a society where there is so much wealth that no one had any need to hoard anything. Communism is a world where there's so much wealth that inequality fades away. Communism, the higher stage of communism, not socialism like they have in Cuba or Venezuela, but the communism is based on so much wealth existing that inequality completely fades away. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs is based on there being so much wealth that the inequality between people fades away. Now, no one had ever explained the economics of communism to me. That's what Marx talks about in Critique of the Goitha Program. Critique of the Goitha Program, Mark, you know, you know, Marx explains that you can't have full communism until you have overcome the problem of scarcity. Communism is a society where labor becomes life's prime want, not a necessity. People don't have to work. They work in order to not be bored. Labor becomes life's prime want, where the springs of cooperative wealth flow so abundantly, where there's no division between mental and physical labor. That that ultimate vision of communism requires so much wealth to exist. And the problem with capitalism is that capitalism prevents the creation of wealth. The problem with capitalism is the more wealth that gets created, the poorer people get. Under capitalism, abundance creates poverty. Under capitalism, people are homeless because there's too many houses. Under capitalism, the computer revolution and the advances in technology led to an economic crisis. The problem with capitalism is that under capitalism, you can never reach that society of vast abundance because under capitalism, abundance and poverty walk hand in hand because of the problem of overproduction. This is actual Marxism. Opposing the wars is good. Standing in solidarity with the third world people against imperialism is good, but I wasn't really a Marxist at that point. I vaguely understood the worker and the capitalist, and I liked Mao, but I wasn't really a Marxist until the financial crisis. Wasn't until the financial crisis, until I understood the Marxist interpretation of the financial crisis. I understood overproduction and the tendency of the falling rate of profit. It wasn't until the financial crisis. It's, it's almost a historical accident that I became a Marxist. Do you realize this? It's almost an accident. I wasn't supposed to become a Marxist, right? I was supposed to become a, you know, lefty anti-war guy and go to college and get a girlfriend and move on with my life. And, you know, if, if it had happened 20 years earlier, that's what would have happened. If it had happened 10 years earlier, that's what would have happened, right? If I'd have been protesting, if I'd have been born 10 years earlier and I'd been in college protesting the Gulf War, you know, of, of, of George Herbert Walker Bush 
you know, that's what would have happened. And I would have, you know, I would have gone to law school or something and become a lawyer and, you know, just remembered my college days as a young protesting Maoist. <laughs> that's not what happened. The reason that I became a Marxist was because of things that had nothing to do, that were way beyond my control, that I'd gotten vaguely interested in Marxism because of anti-imperialism. And then, boom, 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 the economy had crashed. The economy had crashed. And that had forced me to find out why that had happened. And I'd learned actual Marxism about why the economy crashed. I learned the problem of overproduction, the tendency of the falling rate of profit. I learned, you know, you know, production for profit, not social good. I learned, uh, you know, I learned about communism being based on vast material abundance and capitalism not being able to create abundance. I learned real Marxism. I didn't learn this worker cooperative bullshit. I didn't learn, this is what people now think Marxism is, you know, the person who owns the factory and the worker, it's not fair between them. It's just not fair. That's not Marxism. That's a part of Marxism. That's not Marxism. And we're going to make it fair by having a worker cooperative. And it'll be fair because the worker will also be the owner and it'll still function for profit and you'll still have all the problems and, 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 and more technology advances, more people will be unemployed and you'll still have all those problems, but it'll be fair because the worker is also the owner. Yay. That's not Marxism. That ain't Marxism. Marxism is overcoming the irrationality of capitalism. Marxism is organizing the economy to serve public good, overcoming the problems of production organized for profit, of production for profit, not social good, production for sellability, not usability. That, that's actual Marxism. And it's like a historical accident that I became an actual Marxist, that I understood the real Marxist critique of capitalism. You're not supposed to understand that. They've set up the synthetic left. They've set up all kinds of mechanisms to make sure you don't understand this. You want to understand this, pro the, the built-in problem of capitalism. If you want to really understand this stuff, you need to... Um, you need to, you know, go read old communist pamphlets from the 1930s. You got to go read Marx and Lenin. You got to go read the history of the three internationals by William Z. Foster. You got to go, you know, you don't get this analysis, you know, you know, you don't get this analysis from the, uh, you know, the bookstore, the Mar the Marxist books you find at Barnes and Noble do not give you this analysis. But I got this analysis by accident, by accident, I was given this analysis. And it made perfect sense to me a set of concepts that I could understand that could explain the financial crisis. And that's how I became a Marxist. And that's why I, I, I really became a Marxist. I got interested in communism. I was an anti-imperialist. But the way I really became a Marxist was because the financial cr crash happened and I could understand it. And when the financial crash happened, I became a fanatic. That, that place that I was in before where I was just kind of like, eh, that was over. When the financial crash happened, I became a fanatic. I was ready to go all in. I was ready to go all in. I was ready to give my life to this. And I gave my life to it in Cleveland. And then I moved to New York and I gave my life to it. And I was part of Occupy Wall Street. And I traveled around the world. And here we are. And I'm really in this. I am a fanatic. I am absolutely a fanatic. I am fanatical about the fact that the banks, factories, and industries must be organized to serve public good and not the profits of the wealthy few. I am fanatical about the need, the need for countries around the world to break out of this open international system, this global imperialist financial capitalist system. I'm fanatical about why China has been successful because they don't have a state, they don't have a, a profit-centered economy. They have the, the state controlling the means of production. I'm fanatical about this. And what has been frustrating to me is that there is not a place for people that are fanatical about this to go, right? 
all the leftist groups in the United States just tail whatever the liberals are doing. Hey, the liberals are protesting police brutality. All right, we'll do that. Oh, the liberals are, you know, are protesting against this. Oh, we'll do that. You know, they just tail what the liberals are doing. No. I need the Center for Political Innovation to become an institution that can facilitate young people being fanatical about Marxism, fanatical about Marxism, giving their lives to Marxism building a mass movement of working people, striving for people to control the means of production. So that is how I became a Marxist for real. It's not how I got interested in Marxism. That's not, that's not how I, you know, I got involved with communist groups. That's how I really became a Marxist. That's how I really became a Marxist. It was the financial crisis, learning the Marxist economics, and then from there, you know, being, being even more educated and learning about, learning about what the Communist Party achieved in the 1930s. And it's traveling around the world and seeing the countries that have broken out of this system and how they're having great progress, and how capitalism is crashing and burning in the West seeing the alternative economy that's emerging around China and Russia, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, these countries that have broken out of the capitalist system. Seeing that, seeing that has forced me to understand where the future is going. And that's me. And so I hope that while you're listening to me, you're thinking about your own story. You're thinking about what brought you here. But I also hope, and I'll just end my opening remarks by saying this, I also hope I really, really hope that you are figuring out how you can become a fanatic. Because right now, we need fanatics. We really, really need fanatics. We don't need people to just hear this stuff and go, okay, we need fanatics. We need a group of people who are saying, you know what? Screw it. Because there's so many young people I meet who are fucked. They've just been royally fucked by this system. You know, they can go to college, run up student debt, and they're going to still be living with their parents. Short-term, low-wage, service sector job, working at the drugstore, working in fast food. They're miserable. Working at a call center, they're miserable. They're not happy. They're living with their parents, and their parents blame them. Blame them. Say, you're a loser. You're a failure. It's your fault. When I was your age, I didn't even have a high school diploma, and I had a big house because I had a factory job. Look at you. You're lazy. And they hear that degrading shame come down on them every day. Every day they just hear this degrading. You screwed up. It's you, it's your fault. You're a failure. You didn't succeed. You didn't try hard enough. Look, there's that one kid at your school and he got a job with some big corporation and now he's doing well. But look at you. Look at you. You're a screw up. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. You are a product of the economic decay of the United States, the lack of opportunity, the fallout of capitalism. And you're also a product of the cultural decay. Because at the same time that they pulled the economic base of U.S. society out from under you, they also pulled the spiritual base out from under you. You hold your cell phone. Look at your cell phone. There's pessimistic, hope, 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 hope crushing, hateful propaganda coming out of your cell phone at you every day. The advertising, the music, the pessimistic, the bread tubers, the YouTube streamers, the cyber bullying. There's just this negative culture that says there's no truth. There's nothing to believe in. Everything's a matter of opinion. You should just be shallow. There's porn coming at you. They're saying, just use drugs. Try to get high to kill your pain. 
you know, be sarcastic, be cynical. Be there, there, There's just this disgusting culture of death coming at you every day. And it used to be they were telling you, you live in the greatest country in the world, America, the greatest system ever, capitalism. And now and you, you are so... Now they don't say that. And they don't say that anymore. Now they say, there's no point in being alive. There's no future for you. You must be a screw up. You must be a failure. And why do they say that? Because they want you to die. They've, they don't have a place for you in their system. So they want you to die. They want you to kill yourself. They want you to drug yourself to death with opioids. They want you to die because they don't have a place for you in their system. They don't want you to be an obedient little foot soldier like they wanted in the 50s and 60s. They want you dead. They want, they want to reduce living standards. They want to reduce the human population. They view the middle class of America, the, the broad masses of Americans, they view them as, as this annoying horde they have to deal with, this barrier to completely collapsing the United States into their open international system. They want you dead. They're trying to kill you. Yes, they are trying to kill you. They started trying to kill the black people first. We saw that in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina. They left them on their roofs to die. They had the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Superdome, you know, the sports stadium. They like turned it into like almost a mini, mini concentration camp with like armed guards and not letting people leave and they didn't have food and it was a nightmare. Mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex. They started doing it to the black community first. They're doing it to the white community now, too. They're doing it to all the working people. They don't need the aristocracy of labor any longer in their system. They don't. And so they're trying to just make us all go away. And it's not a great replacement. They're doing it to black people. They're doing it to white people. They're doing it to Latinos. They're doing it to Asians. It's not a racial thing. This isn't the great replacement. But the people that are talking about great replacement, they racialize it. They make it about white versus black. They make it about this racial conspiracy theory. And that's why they're wrong. But they're observing something real, which is that, yes, the ruling class does want to kill us. All of us, black, white, Arab, Asian, Latino, they don't need workers at their assembly line anymore. We stand outcast and starving amid the wonders we have made. That's what's going on. It's not a great replacement. It's not a racial thing. It's not they're trying to get rid of the whites and replace them with blacks or get rid of the blacks and replace them with whites. They did go after the black community first. First fired, last hired. They're trying to get rid of all of us because they have no room at the assembly line for us. They are Malthusians. They think the problem isn't capitalism, but that there's just too many people in the world. We need to cull the herd. We need to reduce the population. They're actively trying to exterminate us. Instead of getting us all hyped up with patriotism and brainwashing us to be part of their empire, they're brainwashing us to die. That is what they're doing. And so becoming a communist, becoming a Marxist, is not simply a matter of learning what's true and what's not. It's not simply a matter of taking up history's challenge. It's choosing to live. It's about choosing to live. There's no life for you in this society. The only way you can really live is by fighting this society. There's no life for you in this society. There's no future for you in this society. The only way that you can really live is to fight this society. The only family that you're ever going to really have is going to be the family that you build fighting this society. The only optimism that you are going to get is going to be the optimism that comes from organizing against this system. The only way that you can wake up in the morning and feel like today might be better than yesterday is to fight against this system. By bringing you Marxism, by reaching out to you and inviting you to become a fanatic, to give your life to this, to break from liberalism, to join an illiberal political movement, 
that strives to organize the broad masses of people to work in their collective interest, to seize control of the means of production. By doing that, I am offering you life. You can live or you can die. And I am offering you life. And people hear that and they say, oh, Caleb, you think you're the savior. You think you're the Messiah. No, no, I don't. No, because this applies to me. This absolutely applies to me because I was in that situation. When I was in Cleveland, I spent days without food. Remember one time I didn't eat anything. I had, you know, I had barely any money. I went to the, the grocery store. I bought a bag of rice because it was cheap. And I, and I melted some butter in this bag of rice and I ate nothing but that rice for like three days. That was the only thing I ate was that rice. And when that rice ran out, I didn't have any more food. And then finally I got a little bit of money. So with that little bit of money I had, I went and I, I, I went someplace and I, I got like a, like a slice of pizza from a, a, a restaurant in Cleveland. And I got, I got that slice of pizza and I ate it and I hadn't eaten anything in a few days. But because I was eating it and I was so hungry, you know, because I hadn't eaten anything except that rice for, for a few days and I was hungry. And I remember I, I took that food and it, and it went into my throat and I hadn't put anything in my throat. And as soon as that, that food touched my throat, I vomited. And I remember I ran outside of the restaurant and on the sidewalk in Cleveland, I vomited. I vomited my guts out. And I've had it pretty good. I'm from a pretty middle-class family. You know, but when I used to go sell my blood plasma in Cleveland, I'd go to the blood plasma clinic in Cleveland and there would be a huge line of people, mothers with kids, mothers with kids. And they'd take turns watching each other's kids while they would go in and sell their plasma to get an extra 30 bucks, an extra $30 for the day. These moms from the west side of Cleveland, waiting, waiting their turn to go sell their blood plasma. That's what this system is offering us. They wonder why there's these mass shootings. They wonder why there's the opioid epidemic. They want, this is the breakdown of capitalism. They don't need us anymore. But I am telling you that through joining a mass movement, through joining a revolutionary organization, through giving up your individualism, giving up your petty bourgeois aspirations, and assimilating yourself, and joining a group of people that are dedicated to a cause, You can have a future. You can have life. You can have hope. And you know, I'll just I'll just be honest with you here. I don't get into things too much. But I guess I'll just be a little bit frank in that in a way I am lucky. In a way I am lucky. I'm lucky because me and my dad didn't get along too much. Me and my dad didn't really get along. And after college, there was no way I could move back home because me and my dad didn't see eye to eye. And, you know, there had been a lot of intense stuff when I was a teenager and there was no way I could go back home. And so, you know, I was living, trying to get by in Cleveland. I ultimately had to move to New York. And as awful as that situation is, and as I mean, the pain of not getting along with your parent and, and the pain of, you know, you know, whatever, as awful as that situation is, I'm lucky. I am lucky. I'm lucky. Because, because of the fact that I didn't get along with my dad, because of the fact that I knew I couldn't live at home, I never fell into the trap that a lot of young folks fall into. I know a lot of young people that are in the exact same situation I was in after the financial crisis. 2011, 2010, 2009, 2010, I was in this situation where I wasn't in college anymore. And I couldn't find a job that could feed myself that could, you know, and I was stuck, but I couldn't go home. 
And because I couldn't go home, I had to figure things out. And that led me to go to New York. Because a lot of the young people that I know now, they're stuck. And they're stuck because they could go home. They're stuck because, because for whatever reason, you know, they're living at home. And their parents say, oh, you can live at home. You know, you can live at home. And so then they get stuck. And of course, their parents drag them down and say, oh, you're a screw up. You're a failure. Why don't you get a real job? Why don't you get married and go have kids on your own? They, their parents blame them as if it's their individual fault, right? And there's a certain, and there's something even worse that I've observed. And it's interesting because I, I, I brought this up just gently in a conversation I was having with someone a couple of weeks ago. And I had no idea about this person's life situation. And I, of course, would not tell that person's life situation. I would protect their privacy. You have no idea who I'm talking about. But in a conversation a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned this in passing, I just mentioned this tendency that I've observed. And this person just opened up and described how that was their situation. There's a certain type of toxic parent who lets their kid live at home, their adult child live at home, and, and who runs their child down and says to them, oh, you're a screw up, you're a failure. Why don't you go get a job? You're living off of me. Why can't you grow up and be an adult? And runs them down. But beneath it is sabotaging them. I've seen this many, many times of the parent who doesn't really want their kid to go out on their own. And whenever their young child starts to look like they're going to go and get a job and get their own apartment, they panic and try to stop it. That is toxic. Absolutely toxic. They want the child to live at home and be financially dependent on the parent. And they want to have that on them. It gives them power. And being the parent, even though their child is an adult, being the parent gives them leverage. They're the parent. They're financially supporting the kid. And you're supposed to be an adult and you're not. And you're living at home. So they've got that on them. It's leverage. And that is a recipe for death. That is a toxic situation where you have a parent who's actively sabotaging you, doesn't want you to go out on your own, doesn't want you to go out, even if you could, right? As hard as it is now, with good, as hard as it is to get a decent job, as hard as it is to, you know, to be able to, you know, go start a family on your own, as hard as it is, you have a parent on top of that, that while they're running you down about it, while they're running you down about it, they're, also subtly sabotaging you. They don't want you to go out on your own. They want you to be dependent on them. They want you to live in their household and they want to be able to call you lazy and call you a failure and tell you you never succeeded. And that is a toxic parent. I have known so many people my age or younger who dealt with that situation with a parent who did not want them, who did not want them to actually succeed. It's toxic. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous situation. It's a dangerous situation. Our generation, young Americans, have been royally screwed by this system. But I got to tell you, that there is nothing more rewarding than becoming a revolutionary. There's nothing more rewarding than becoming a revolutionary, than giving your life to fight back against the system. Nothing more rewarding than that. To have comrades. To have people who help you be happy. Your happiness is dependent on other people. The reason that the pandemic was such a hard time for people was because the pandemic was a time in which people were isolated. You need other people's happiness. When you're in a room with people that are smiling, you're going to start smiling. But to be part of an organization of people who feed their energy to you, they're giving you their positive energy and you're giving them your positive energy back and you're playing off of each other's positive energy. 
and you share the same goal to go out and struggle and overturn the capitalist system, to fight the bosses, to fight for a government of action, to, to be in an organization where you can feed off their energy and they can feed off their energy. And when you start to slip, they lift you up. And when you start to slip, they lift you up. To have a structured life, a structured life where every day you got something going on, where you're waking up and you're doing more activism with somebody else and you're going out and you're organizing and you're studying ideology together and you're learning about the world together and you're making real advances together and you're, and you're learning from your mistakes. To be part of an organization, to be a revolutionary, an active revolutionary is an amazing experience. Amazing experience. It's an absolutely amazing experience. And I want you to have that experience. I want to make that happen. CPI is getting set up right now. It's difficult to set it up. We're figuring out one thing. We got our national gathering coming up. I've been on the phone. It seems like there's not a minute I'm not on the phone talking to somebody about making it happen, but it's important. I got to do it. And we're doing the event in Chicago, but we're trying to set up a cadre, an organization of fanatics, of people who give the whole of their lives to spreading the revolutionary message, a place that you can go where you don't have to be trapped. You don't have to be hopeless. You don't have to be dead. You don't have to be at the mercy of a toxic parent that doesn't really want you to go out and succeed on your own. We're trying to build an organization that can facilitate people becoming real revolutionaries. And that's what needs to happen. So we're trying to figure it out and it's, it's happening. I mean, one step at a time, it's happening. I had the John Brown volunteers. We still got the John Brown volunteers. They've evolved the way they're operating. We're doing things one way, we're doing things another way, but things are starting to happen. And you ought to be a part of it. And if you're stuck in that situation that I just described, you're stuck living at home, you're stuck feeling like you don't have a future, you got a, a cell phone full of propaganda telling you to kill yourself, telling you to die, you've got a, a lack of an economic future, you should choose life. You should be a revolutionary. And I can't make you do it. I cannot make you do it. And one of my biggest mistakes has been trying to make people do it. And you can't. You can't make people do it. But if you want it, if the part of you that's listening now that wants it, if that part of you that wants to be a revolutionary is awakened by what I'm saying, Listen to it. There's a little part of you, if you're in that situation, there's plenty of people watching that are probably in different situations, but if there's a part of you that is in the situation that I am describing, that hears everything I'm saying and agrees with me, listen to it. Do yourself a favor. Listen to it and become part of a community. Learn to flush the toxicity out. Learn to learn to wake up every morning with classical music, go to sleep every night with classical music. Learn to think about Marxism and socialism. Learn to be part of a revolutionary organization. That's what we're trying to do. The door is open and I can't make you walk through it. But if you do, if you do walk through it, as I did, you've got a better chance of being happy than you do under this system. And so in addition to understanding economics, understanding the problems of capitalism, I'm offering you 
the possibility of being part something being part of something bigger than yourself. I'm offering that to you. You can take it or you can leave it. And that's the way the world works. And that's what I've got to say to you tonight in my opening remarks. So there you go, folks. Those were my opening remarks for tonight. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notifications bell. Don D from NYC is going to send me the super chats. And we're going to answer those in the second half of the show. So thank you, Don D, for, for doing that. And now I'll call you all out as I see you. Names and locations. Names and locations. Let's see. Who's with us tonight? Who's on the other side of the camera? Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Who's with us? Who's with us? We got Ryan in Oakland. We got Smedley Butler in Chicago. Very, very cool. We got Cleveland, Pirate Alex, Micah in Las Vegas, Jamie in St. Paul, Tristan in Maryland, Parasocialite. Shout out to you. Great stuff. Cedar in Texas, Mary Fox in River Valley, Wisconsin. Jenny Lynn from Cincinnati, Jeremy from Missouri, Tacoma, Mark Hillary from Tacoma, Mike from Arcata, Mark Jones from Utica, Philip Philippe from Paraguay, Calgary, Alan in Chicago, Chris in Dallas, Moonlight Beach, California, Dustin Schlesinger in Cleveland, Ohio, Alexis in New York, Tony in Prince George, San Francisco, Chris Morlock, Wavy in Seattle, Zach in rainy Seattle, Valeria in Florida, David Rennie in Hamilton, Canada, Oakland, California, Omar in Toronto, San Antonio, Texas, Mo and Pomona and Danielle in Pomona, California. Very, very good. Gary Curtis, Gary Curtis. Very good. Yada Yisrael in Chicago, Lamona, Uruguay, Christina in California, Nevada, Stig Stigmaris in Nevada, Antoine in New York, Luke from Madison, Wisconsin, Don D from NYC. Love you, Don, and I appreciate all that you're doing, writing the Super Chats down and so much more. West Coast, Minus in Brazil, Mosin from Iran, Carter from Duluth, St. David's Bermuda, Kieran from San Diego, Isabel from Toronto, the Canadian one. Very, very, very good. Very, 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 very good. Who else is with us tonight? Who else is with us tonight? Richard from the Woodland. From Woodland. Very, very good. Henry from North Carolina. Melbourne. Esti from Mel Melbourne. Very, very good. Very, very good. St. David's Bermuda. Kieran from San Diego. Very, very good. Very, very good. All right. If there's any more names, I'll do that. Um, let's see if Don D from NYC sent. Yes, he did. Don D from NYC has sent me the super chats. So I'm going to give some super answers to those super chats. Well, maybe not super answers, but I will give them answers. That is what we always try to do. And when we say answers, we are not referring to the front group of PSL, act now to stop war and end racism. We're not referring to answer. We're referring to answers to questions. Ha, ha, ha. Very funny. Very funny. All right. Good stuff, folks. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. We got Maple in Chapel Hill. Uh, Amadou from New York. Lawrence from Kansas. We got Kinky from Joshua Tree. Isaac. Isaiah from Dallas. Isaiah. Lawrence, Kansas. Bismuth, LOL. Jenny, LOL. Very, very good. Very, very good. Maple and uh, we got Naples. Harold Sullivan. We got Matt Macbeth's head. Very, 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 very good. Very, 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 very good. All right. We'll start answering questions. First super chat was David Fox. He said, um, can't uh, can't wait, but I have to stick around. He's got a meeting. Thanks, David Fox. Awesome. Were Soviet-occupied nations in Eastern Europe forced to become communist, or was it voluntary? And do price controls lead to shortages or not? Were nations in Eastern Europe forced to become communist? I would argue that they were not. They were not exactly forced to become communist, but given the circumstances, it's very hard to foresee them ever not doing that, right? You recommend the most important works by Stalin, including um, the top important works by Stalin, including his response to Trotsky's Lessons of October. All right, writing that down, right? Important works. Stalin, including his response to 
Trotsky's Lessons of October. All righty. All right. All right. So after the Second World War was over, the government, uh, you know, the Soviet Union, the Soviet troops liberated a number of countries from the Nazis. And when they took power, right, when the Nazis were removed, they set up, you know, provisional governments that included all anti-Nazi parties. Any party that was in, you know, in Eastern Europe, in Romania, in Czechoslovakia, in East Germany, anyone who was anti-Nazi, anti-fascist in Poland was allowed to be part of the government. If you were part of the, if you were a pro-Nazi, you weren't allowed to be part of the government. A lot of Nazis got executed. A lot of Nazi collaborators got executed or went to prison. But they tended to bring into the government, which plays a bigger role in U.S. imperialism today, big tech or big oil. They, they brought into the government anyone who was anti-Nazi. And they formed a coalition government. It would be the Communist Party, but there'd also be usually the Social Democratic Party. Uh, usually they would have the Christian Democratic Party or the Christian Party. Um, in some cases, there would be, you know, more of a liberal party. And it was a government of anti-fascist forces. And they called these governments the People's Democracies. People's Democratic Governments, they were called. However, the Soviet Union started providing aid to these countries. And because the Soviet Union was providing financial aid to these countries, because the Soviet Union had set up these people's democratic governments, the United States then blockaded these countries, right? NATO was formed. These countries were subject to an economic blockade. So these countries were originally people's democratic governments, meaning they had all anti-fascist parties, and Bismuth just read about this, had all the anti-fascist parties in the government, but the Soviet Union was providing the aid and the USA was blockading them. And so based on that, the communists got more and more credibility because the Soviet Union was their ally and the pro-American folks got more and more obscure because look what the United States is doing, it's blockading them. And so eventually what happened is that in these countries, the major anti-fascist parties would merge into one party. That's why in East Germany, the ruling party was not the Communist Party. Did you know that? In East Germany, it was not the Communist Party. The German Communist Party merged with the German Social Democratic Party, the East German wing of it, merged with the Christian Democratic Party, and they formed the Socialist Unity Party of East Germany. Because the, the new Marxist-Leninist Party that would be formed, it would be a merger of the anti-fascist parties that had come together to govern the countries after the war. That's why, you know, it was the, you know, and North Korea, right? It was every anti-Japanese party participated in the government, the Christian party, the Social Democratic Party, and the Communist Party. So they merged into the Korean Workers Party, right? And that, that's how these countries became, became socialist. It was kind of forced by the United States, right? And that's, again, you know, when, when Jason threw a big fit in our recent debate about, no, no, Mao never wanted a coalition government. He wanted to keep killing until the whole world was communist. That's false, right? They wanted to form a coalition government with all anti-Japanese forces. Chiang Kai-shek wouldn't allow it, so they got the civil war. But in the northern half of the Korean peninsula, they formed a coalition government with all the anti-fascist forces. And, uh, you know, and eventually that led to a socialist government because the United States, you know, was so hostile. It kind of created an either-or situation. The United States forced an either-or situation on the countries of the Eastern Bloc. They, many of them, Poland especially, Romania, they wouldn't have gone socialist if it hadn't been for the United States forcing either-or on them. And that's a fact. Um, as far as do price controls create shortages? No, not necessarily. I mean, it depends. The, the thing about price controls is you're controlling the price. If you control the price in a really ineffective way, the result can be shortages. But if you strategically control the price in a way that keeps up with production, et cetera, you cannot. I mean, you know, price controls, there's, I mean, you have, you have somebody setting the prices. The market is not setting the prices. It's being arbitrarily set. It's called price controls. 
Now, in some cases, you can have bad price controllers who do it in a bad way, and as a result, it leads to shortages. On the other hand, you can have price controls that are done very effectively. In Russia, the price today, the price of food is heavily subsidized by the government, right? Cheap in Ru food in Russia is very cheap because the government uses the oil money to subsidize it. So, you know, that's price controlling because they're subsidizing and, and making the price of food very cheap because it's government subsidized. And it's not leading to shortages at all. Russia's had some of the biggest harvests uh, in the history of the country. I mean, they're not having food shortages. They're having, they've got plenty of food in Russia, you know, um, and that's because of the fact that, you know, they do have subsidized prices of food. It's very cheap. And, and so you get what I'm saying, right? This is, it, it just depends. There are instances where price controls can lead to food shortages or shortages, but there are instances where it doesn't. Just having them, it depends how the prices are put. All right, next question. Next question. All righty, next question. All right. How is China a communist state? They're rich. That's the person who asked the question is called die trying. Well, first of all, I mean, when you say China is a communist state, I assume you mean that they're a state led by a communist party. And that's the fact. The Communist Party of China rules China. The economic system that China has is called socialism with Chinese characteristics. It is an economic system in which there is a five-year economic plan, in which there's 51% state ownership, and in which the state regulates and controls the economy in order to ensure that growth is unlimited. They've wiped out um, extreme poverty in the country. Uh, they have greatly expanded their major industries. Millions of people have become part of the middle class. Uh, before the pandemic, every single day, a new Chinese millionaire was being created because they control the means of production. Now there's a very big market sector, and they use that market sector to the benefit of socialism. Um, but it's not capitalist because profits are not in command, right? That's what the difference between capitalism and socialism is. If profits were in command, that would be capitalism. But because the economy is being forced to work for the benefit of society, and as a result, growth is unlimited because it's not held back by the irrationality of the market, that's what socialism is, right? Um, it's a socialist society. But communism, the ultimate goal of communism is a stateless, classless world of vast material abundance. Communism is a world where everyone is rich, and there's so much wealth that exists, so much wealth that exists uh, that inequality fades away. Um, so there you go. All right. Next question. All right. All right. Uh, politics mean compromise. When the revolution comes, can there be any compromise on the four point plan? What do you mean when the revolution comes? What does that mean? I mean, if there were some kind of, you know, mass uprising to create socialism, I think our four point plan would be pretty irrelevant. Right. I mean, if there was some revolutionary socialist group on the brink of taking control of the government, our four point plan would serve no purpose, right? That that revolutionary socialist group would have a plan of its own. And that plan would be what people were supporting them on the basis of. And so our plan wouldn't exist. The reason we have our four point plan is these are four things that could be implemented. These are four policies that the government could carry out, but they don't because it's run by big capitalists because it works for the big banks and the big monopolies, right? Did your... Okay. Dude. Right? And that's the point. These four demands are things that could be implemented. That you know, you could see this happening. Public control of our natural resources, public control of banking, an economic bill of rights. Uh, you know, a mass program to rebuild the country. These are things that you could see happening, but won't happen because the government is run by big corporations and banks. And in order to bring to power a government that could implement them, you would have to build a mass working class movement. And that that's why it exists, right? It's there as a form of agitation to say this could happen, but it's not, right? And that's the point. And so if there was a revolution going on, you know, this four point plan would not be necessary. But revolutions tend to involve 
plans that sound a lot like the four-point plan I just raised. Go and read Kim Il-sung's 14-point program that brought the the Japanese, uh, that brought the uh, the the resistance to Japan, you know, the the Korean Workers' Party to power. Go and read it for yourself. A lot of them are pretty reasonable demands. Public schools, you know, public schools, set up a healthcare system for the country. Things that sound pretty basic, but in essence are revolutionary, right? And that if you look at, you know, the, the platform that Mao took power on or the platform of the Bolsheviks, peace, land, and bread, these are things that seem pretty, pretty basic. But in order to carry them out, you have to strike at the fundamentals of the system. And that this four-point plan is something that by going to people and saying this could happen, but it only it doesn't happen because the politicians are controlled by the capitalists. By confronting the politicians and saying, are you for this four-point plan? Are you against it? This is pushing forward the class struggle. And that's what a transitional demand or a revolutionary program or a united front does. That's the idea. If you go anywhere in the world, this is what communists do. They run in elections. They agitate, they put forward policies that could be implemented, not violently overthrow the government, not people's war until communism, but policies that could absolutely be implemented, but ain't because of capitalism. That's what they do. That's what they do. All right, next question. All right, what's going on in Armenia? I actually don't know. I haven't been following the news today, so I can't comment on that. All right, Andre gave a great $20 super chat. I do appreciate it, Andre, and thank you. All right. Caleb, if you or anybody else is interested, I recommend you read The Restoration of Capitalism in the Soviet Union by Bill Bland. I have read it. My friend, I have read it. Bill Bland was a Hojaist. He was a follower of Enver Hoxha, who lived in Britain. Uh, he was the leader of which group? Was it the Workers' Party of the of the UK, Marxist-Leninist, or the... Um, which one? I rich, forget which one he was in. He wasn't... There was the Bainesites, right, in Britain. So, right. So in Britain... All right, you have the RCPBML, and that's the followers of Hardiel Baines, uh, and that's the um, what is it? That's the uh, you know that's that's the Hojist group. But there was another Hojist group, right? And that's the Bill Bland one. Bill Bland was a follower of Enver Hoxha. It was you know Albania and China were aligned, and then in 1978, Albania cut ties with China, and so the followers of, of Albania broke away and formed their own parties. And so in the United States, you had um, you had the what's now called the United States Marxist-Leninist Organization, which used to be the Marxist-Leninist Party. And in the United States, you also had uh, the Rayolite Revolution Organization of Labor Group. And uh, there's a couple other ones, right? Um, the Enver Hoxha groups, right? And in Britain, Bill Bland was one of these. And they believed that capitalism was restored in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, and yeah, I've read Bill Bland and I don't agree with it. I don't buy it. I mean, they make arguments like, well, it was state run, but the factories were required to produce so much. So that's just like profit. No, I mean, the Soviet economy was not functioning according to profit. It wasn't. Now, they were doing market reforms and stuff in the 80s, but it was still socialist until the full on counter revolution. Really, they didn't take apart the economic structures of the Soviet Union until like 1994. Right. There was a political counter-revolution in the Soviet Union long before there was an economic counter-revolution. 1991, the Soviet Union was dissolved, but it took them a couple of years to dismantle the state-run economy. And a lot of it stayed intact. Right. And that's the basis of Vladimir Putin. A lot of what Vladimir Putin did when he came in is he was just he amped up the remnants of the state-run economy. There was still a huge state bureaucracy, huge military, huge secret, you know, security services and such. And when Putin came in, a lot a lot of what he did in order to set up kind of a Bonapartist government to, to defeat the counter-revolution, a lot of what Putin did was just amp up elements of the Soviet Union that had never been fully dismantled. Um, you know, but yeah, a lot of, I mean, the, the dismantling of the state-run economy in the Soviet Union took quite some time, right? And the idea that it happened in the 50s when Stalin died, that's, that's not true. That's just not true. Um, all right, CPI. All right. CPI. All right. Depleting underground aquifers at a faster rate. All right. Building.
aquifers. All right, wrote it down. Caleb, uh, oh, I already did that one. Any recommendation of the writings of Jose Maria Sassan, the founder of the Communist Party of the Philippines? I've read some of that stuff. Um, you know, he's certainly an effective organizer, um, you know, and there's certainly a lot of people in the Philippines who admire him, a lot of people around the world, a lot of Filipinos around the world who admire him. Um, my understanding is that they've gone into a, a belief that China is the main danger to the Philippines, and that's not what I think. But that doesn't mean I don't respect the mass work they've done in organizing the Filipino, Filipino communities, opposing U.S. imperialism. The, the folks, I think it's called, uh, the folks that admire Jose Maria Sasan, you know, that are inspired by his movement, um, you know, have done a lot of amazing anti-imperialist work over the years. And I've read some of that. I have a couple of the volumes of, of Joe Ma Sasan's writings. And I know about that stuff, but my understanding is that they've gone into uh, an anti-China fixation at this point. So they're not really aligned with me at this point, because I think China is a socialist country that is the main uh, the main hope at, at this point for the world. So there you go. Um, but there you go. Yeah, I know about them. And he's in the Netherlands in exile. All right. Hello from the state of Eugene Debs, Indiana. I love this community, but I do feel a bit on an island living in Indiana. Any advice on how I could help CPI in the most impactful way? This is more than a hobby. Well, we have people in Indiana. Uh, there's a great chapter of the Center for Political Innovation in Evansville. There's the, the Students and Youth for a New America clubs, and they have a reading group where they're studying our, our writings, and they are based in Indiana. Um, so that's one way you could get involved. I recommend you contact the Students and Youth for a New America club uh, and say that you're a CPI member in Indiana and you want to connect with the folks out in Evansville. They had a great event. Keaton was there uh, for May 1st. They had like a cookout and Keaton was there and he interviewed them. We put it in our video. So if you're out in Indiana and you want to reach those folks, Evansville, uh, we got a, an active group. There's an active cell uh, of, of Students in Youth for a New America out there. Um, now, the other thing is that August 6th, uh, we will be in Chicago. Now, Chicago is not in Indiana. It's in Illinois, but it's near northern Indiana. So if you're in northern Indiana, like where, um, uh, what is it, Notre Dame and South Bend and all of that are, if you're up by that wing of Indiana, um, you know, by all means, come to our event August 6th in Chicago. We're going to have a great anti-imperialist rally. Garland Nixon is going to be there. He confirmed today. Garland Nixon is going to be at the CPI's event in Indiana. It's going to be awesome. Garland Nixon will be there. And um, we also understand that in addition to Garland Nixon, Dan Kavalik is going to be there. Very good chance Max Blumenthal will be there. Not 100% confirmed. It's going to be a kick-ass anti-imperialist rally. Unite against the imperialist August 6th. Uh, so that'll be near Indiana. So if you can drive to that, um, I think that'd be great. So yeah, there's definitely ways to get involved. Um, so there's people in your area in Indiana who can, who can connect with you. Um, you know, very, very good. All right. Uh, what do you say to those who respond to the claim that overproduction problem, uh, who think it can be solved with wealth redistribution? I mean. Louis said, okay, all right. So, you know, we, what does wealth redistribution mean? Progressive income tax. Right. So rich people paid more taxes and then poorer people got more services like schools and hospitals. But that would still you'd still have the problem of the workers not being able to buy back the product that they produce. So I, it wouldn't solve the problem, I don't think. Um, you know, I mean, wealth distribution goes on the redistribution of wealth. We need to lose that term. Right. Because, first of all, conservatives are programmed to oppose it. Right. If you say to a conservative, you want to redistribute wealth, they're like, I worked hard for my wealth. No one's going to take my wealth away. You know, oh, you want to take my car and my house from my cold, dead hands, from my cold, dead hands, um, you know, but, you know, we don't want to take your house. We don't want to take your car. We want to organize the economy so that everyone can have a house and a car and everyone can have a comfortable existence and that you don't have to struggle so hard your whole life just to have that house and car, right? We want everyone to be wealthy. We want everyone to be comfortable, right? So... You know, we need to lose that phrase redistribution of wealth because even, yes, taxing billionaires, I'm for it, but that is not socialism. 
right? They do it under every system. Every system, you know, redistributes wealth to some degree or other. Some do it a lot, some do it a little. We redistribute to corporations in the term form of corporate welfare, corporate subsidies. We redistribute to low income folks. You know, some of the programs that are quote unquote redistribution of wealth are are done purely like as a, like, for example, food stamps. It, that's for agribusiness. You know, you know how much money the, the big corporations, the big farming, you know, agribusiness corporations would lose. You know how much money Kraft would lose if they if they didn't, you know, if they didn't get, uh, you know, if they didn't get, you know, food stamps, if people weren't buying stuff with food stamps. I mean, it's like it's some of this wealth redistribution is just an attempt to stabilize capitalism. So, you know, we need to if we're telling people that socialism is better than capitalism, we need to stop using the phrase redistribution of wealth because that's not what it's about. And that feeds into this idea that we're Democrats, right? Democrats want to redistribute wealth and give money to poor people. Republicans want people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. We ain't Democrats, right? I mean, I'm sorry, socialism is not being a Democrat. And trust me, if I thought socialism was the Democrats, I would hate socialism. I mean, look, the synthetic left has gotten so satanic and so evil at this point. They are so vicious and nasty and hateful that a lot of average Americans are tired of them. A lot of average Americans are really tired of them. You know, there's this awful video today of a, of a, of a pro-abortion marcher who got really badly beat up by a police officer. It was a brutal act of police brutality. It's an awful crime. This woman, she was in the street with her bullhorn and the police jumped on her. It was vicious. And that cop should go to jail for doing that. He had no right to jump on her that way. He didn't have to, you know, and I mean, you know, it's like, you know, maybe he needed to move her out of the street, but he didn't have to treat her that way. It's awful. But the sad thing is that there are many Americans, and I, I hate to break it to you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I don't agree with them. Okay. I'm saying this. I do not think this. But there are many Americans who probably watched that video and thought, get her, because they're so tired of the shrill, you know, we all know these like shrill, feminist, you know, you know, you're a Nazi, you're racist, you know, and there's, there's a lot of Americans who are just so tired of the synthetic left. It's so toxic. It's so disgusting. And they are cheering for brutality and that's wrong. I mean, that cop should lose his job. That was police brutality. He had no right to attack that woman that way. But unfortunately, the synthetic left has gotten to be so toxic and so evil that there are a lot of Americans that just hate it so much. Right. I mean, I mean, Joel Osteen is a con artist. He's a piece of crap. In my view, what he's preaching is not Christianity, prosperity gospel. It's this stupid self-help, stupid self. I'm here to give you some stupid self-help with Bible verses. I'm Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen's a piece of shit. He's awful. I hate Joel Osteen. That's not Christianity. That's not. It's just stupid self-help garbage. You know, I mean, it's, it's stupid self-help garbage. God will make you rich. Hold up your Bible. I am oh, I am what it says I am. He's a piece of crap. Joel Osteen is a piece of crap. However, when activists associated with the Revolutionary Communist Party went into Joel Osteen's church, RCP members went into Joel Osteen's church on Sunday, took their clothes off, stripped naked and started screaming about my body, my choice. That's, come on. What are you, are you helping in any way? How are you doing anything good by doing that? Do you think all those people in that church, all those people in that huge auditorium where Joel Osteen does his church, do you think any of them said, oh boy, they're taking their clothes off and screaming about my body, my choice. I'm going to reconsider my position on Roe versus Wade. Why, you know, Sansara Taylor and the RCP are screaming and yelling and by golly, I mean, I mean, they they screamed and yelled and took their clothes off in a holy building, and that convinced me. By golly, I I'm I'm going to support Roe versus Wade. I mean, come on, right? I mean, and it's like a lot of Americans they're just so tired of this. They're so tired of this shrill, you know, you're a Nazi. Oh, you don't agree with me on something? Well, you need to be killed. You're the same as Hitler. I'm. They're so tired of this. You know, there's a lot of Americans who would really love to, you know, I could name some names here, but this will get clipped and then they'll say I advocated violence against them. You know what I'm talking about. There's, you know, you know, you know, there's a lot of Americans that would love to see. They're just so tired of the shrill hate, the, the hate, this adolescent, teenage, shrill, negative, pessimistic, angry, 
blue haired, nose ringed death cult that is being unleashed by the Democrats right now to harass the whole country. And, and, you know, a lot of people are sick of it, you know, and you blame them for being sick of it. I mean, I, 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 they, but they need to understand that's not communism. And if I thought that was communism, I would hate communism. You know, I would hate communism. You know, I I would, you know, if I thought, you know, the RCP stripping naked at Joel Osteen's, you know, church service and screaming about my body, my church. If if I thought that was communism, I would hate communism. If I thought communism was, you know, this cancel culture shit. If I thought communism was burning down black neighborhoods. If I thought communism was, you know, taking everyone's guns away. If I thought communism was you know, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, was, was, you know, burning American flags and I would, I would hate communism too. Right. And that, you know, working people, they need to be optimistic in order to keep going. They need to believe in something. They need to have a community. They need to have a family. And when they see their community and their family and their identity under attack by a group of shrill, not, you know, people that don't seem to stand for anything, they're just against everything and they want to tear it down, burn it down. You know, they're against it. Well, we need to show them that's not what communism is. Communism is about building a new America for working families. It's our four-point plan. It's an optimistic, progressive thing. We are the true patriots. We're the real patriots. We love our country so much. We want to break it out of capitalism. We want it to be reborn on new values. We need to change it. We have an aesthetic objection to the death cult that is speaking in our name. You do not, you you know, this worker cooperatives you know, transgender obsessed, uh, you know, all Republicans are Nazis and need to be shot and lined up and killed. That cult is not Marxism. They're not Marxists in any conceivable way. They're pro-imperialist. They believe in the free market capitalist system. They're triggered by any notion of collectivism or collective will or class struggle. Um, You know, I, I mean, the blue haired, you know, nose ring cult, they are not Marxists in any conceivable way. But I was in it once. I told you all I was in it at one time and I got better. I saw through it. And I think a lot of them can be cured. And we ought to figure out some way to deprogram people, you know, of of wokeness. Right. And there's there's ways to do it. Right. You know, of helping people see through that garbage. There's many people that are part of the CPI community that used to be woke. They used to be wokes and they woke up from it. They woke up from wokeness. So there you go. Maybe that should be a series of videos. How I woke up from wokeness. There you go. All right. Um, uh, someone who calls himself Stupid Man said, I'm ex-CPUSA. I'm Catholic now and repented. Personal mortality matters too. I'm apolitical. Pray for peace. Good for you. Good for you. But I'm sorry, but I don't think apolitical is the answer. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I think that, you know, we need political action. The working class needs to engage in political action and that if Jesus was alive today, he wouldn't want there to be a country that puts profit over people, that allows children to go hungry, that that sees the next generation dying of opioids, that is watching the country be devastated. He wouldn't want a system that's promoting war in order for profits. I, I think that if Jesus were alive today, he wouldn't say, OK, just stay out of politics, just sit back and let let everything go to hell and let the let the op- let, let the people be killed off by the ruling class. No, he would say it's time to be bold and take a stand and be courageous. And in fact, if you read Jesus's messages to his followers, just, you know, if you read just Jesus's teachings, if that's if you if you read only the Gospels and only what Jesus said, that dude is a communist. That dude is a revolutionary. He is telling his people the, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. A rich man went to Jesus and said, what can I do to be perfect? And so what did Jesus say to him? He said, oh, you want to be perfect? He said, sell everything you own and give it to the poor. And the guy walked away sadly, it says, because he was a very wealthy man. He wasn't going to do that. That wasn't what he wanted to hear. Right. Uh, that rich man thought, oh, I'm I'm already so much better than everybody else. And what can I do to be perfect? What's one thing I can do? And I'll be totally perfect. He said, oh, sell everything you have and give it to poor people. You know, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the Bible really comes across. He's telling his followers, leave your family, leave your job. You know, your fisherman, leave your net behind and come follow me. Right. And you, people are going to persecute you for what you stand for. And people are going to attack you, you know, and, you know, but but. The heroes are those who make sacrifices for the cause of right. 
I mean, Jesus was a revolutionary in every conceivable way. So I don't think, I mean, I respect your religious beliefs, sir, but I, I, I don't think that, um, that Jesus would want you to stay out of politics. I think he would want you, he would want you to be politically active on behalf of the oppressed and the downtrodden. He would want you to stand up to the powerful and for the powerless. He, he would want you to make sacrifices for the cause of righteousness. So that's my personal opinion. One Christian to another. All right. And Joey Austis sent a nice super chat and I appreciate it. Um, all right. And important works by Stalin, including his response to Trotsky's Lessons of October. Well, Stalin's response to Trotsky's Lessons of October is Trotsky claimed in his pamphlet, The Lessons of October, that the Bolsheviks had a meeting and they were debating whether or not to seize power. And then a working class person burst in, burst in to the meeting and said, oh, if there's going to be a revolution, whether you want one or not. And so then the Bolsheviks said, oh, we got to take power. And Stalin says that's bullshit because the Bolshevik Central Committee did not meet at places where random people could just burst in off the street and say things. And that's a made up story. It's a myth. And uh, Stalin talks about that. Um, I think the foundations of Leninism is a series of lectures that Stalin gave after Lenin's death about what it means to be a communist, about what Lenin's teachings meant. Um, uh, what else is by Stalin that's good? Um, the speeches that Stalin gave about Lenin are pretty good. I'm trying to think what else. Uh, the Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR. Uh, that was written before Stalin's death. He talks about how they did have commodity production in the Soviet Union. Some people said it couldn't be socialist because they have commodities. He explains why it is socialist. Um, you know, um, there's a, a lot of good compendiums. There's a very good like book called On the Opposition. And it's a compilation of all of Stalin's writings about Trotsky and why Trotsky was wrong. That's very good. Um, there's, uh, what else is there by Stalin that's, that's worth reading? Um, you know, there's this very strange book that I used to sell, right? When I was with that Maoist group, people would always buy it. We had it on the shelf at the bookstore. And it's called Marxism and the Problems of Linguistics by Stalin. And I, he wrote a book about linguistics in the 1940s, like late 40s, after World War II, he wrote this book, Marxism and the Problems of Linguistics. And people would buy it. And I always wondered, like, I never could make heads or tails of that book. But there you go. I, I, it was obviously meant to resolve some kind of dispute in the party or something. But there you go. All right. Next question. <laughs> uh, which is bigger in U.S. imperialism, big tech or big oil? Well, it depends what you mean bigger. OK, because big oil, look, everything is oil like, you know, this pen has plastic, right? That's like a plastic handle there. That's oil, right? I mean, you get in a car, that's oil. You get in a, a, a plane, that's oil. You're in a ship in the ocean, that's oil. Um, you know, anything plastic, that's oil. Um, you know, oil is used in everything. But big tech is controlling discourse. I mean, you know, the, the big tech companies, we're on the internet right now. That's big tech. StreamYard, that's big tech. YouTube, that's big tech. Facebook, that's big tech. Twitter, that's big tech. So it goes both ways, right? They're aligned with each other. The Eastern establishment that runs big oil, the four super major oil companies, Chevron, BP, Shell, and ExxonMobil, that's the Rockefellers, that's the Morgans, um, that's the Carnegies, the DuPonts, those old New England money families that are tied in with the British, you know, and with BP and, and, and all of that. They're tied in with the British, that the Anglo-American establishment, the Eastern establishment. Silicon Valley is something they created. It was created by them. Now, it has an axis of its own. Um, there's a lot of libertarians in Silicon Valley, even though, you know, you know, it's overall aligned with the Democrats who are not libertarian, but you know, Silicon Valley is a little bit different, but they created it. The NSA and the CIA created Silicon Valley. Google it, right? Read about, you know, CIA, NSA, and IBM, CIA, NSA, and Apple, CIA, NSA, and Google, and Microsoft. They, the market wasn't going to make the computer revolution happen. And so the intelligence agencies that are very much linked to the Eastern establishment made a strategic decision in the 70s and 80s to pour lots of money into computer research because they realized the Soviets couldn't. The Soviet Union just didn't have the resources, you know, to, to pour in there. And so it was a strategically made decision. All right. So so they're really wings of the same axis within U.S. power. 
But at the same time, they have, you know, you know, I mean, you know, Silicon Valley is trying to control our minds. Big oil companies are making profits from the most valued commodity. So there you go. Did the GDR give Germany the socialism that Rosa Luxemburg fought for? Well, see, I feel like that's a trap, right? That's a trick question because I'm supposed to say yes because I'm an evil Stalinist. And then they're supposed to be, aha! And then you're supposed to read off about how Rosa Luxemburg wanted pure workers' democracy and all of that. But I'm actually going to say no. And the reason I'm going to say no is because, first of all, all of Germany wasn't socialist. Right? It was only East Germany. And on top of that, East Germany was not, it was under, it was surrounded. It was barricaded, right? And and so, no, the socialism that Rosa Luxemburg fought for was socialism that would eventually lead to this stateless, classless world of communism. Rosa Luxemburg, East Germany didn't fight for that. You know, it's not the socialism East Germany. It's not the socialism Eric Honecker wanted either. This is where people fall into this trap. They say, Caleb, what's your ideal world? It's like, I look at North Korea. I don't want that to be my ideal world. You think North Korea wants that to be their ideal world? Of course not. Right? North Korea is the way it is because it's surrounded and it's under attack. But socialism and the defeat of U.S. imperialism will lead to eventually creating the world that we all want, which is a stateless, classless world of vast material abundance. Right? Rosa Luxemburg was fighting for communism, for the whole world, not just Germany, to have a society with so much wealth and abundance that the state fades away, that inequality and social hierarchies fade away. That's what she was fighting for. And was that realized in East Germany under Eric Honecker? No. Were great strides made in terms of women's liberation, LGBT liberation, you know, raising people up out of poverty? It's a, of course they were. Of course they were. Um, you know, but but you know, it's like it's not like you know, the reason East Germany was the way it was was not because Eric Honecker sat there and said, hmm, how should we make East Germany? I know it's not. It was a result of material conditions. And socialism is a process. It's a process. So there you go. That's that's my answer to that. All righty. And the last question is someone asked, they said, CPI advocates building the river of life. Uh, and they asked about details about underground aquifers. I don't know enough about that. All right. And, you know, it's a proposal. It's an idea, and it would take real engineers and scientists to come up with it. And I'm actually excited because my friends at the Schiller Institute, they have a proposal around aquifers that they've developed called NAWAPA, which I know nothing about. But they actually have a lot of the details about how a great aqua aqueduct irrigation project could be carried out. And I'm actually anxious to learn about it. They've sent me some articles that I need to read, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's the point I want to make there. And so I'm going to end this stream, um, and I thank Robert Lawrence for making the video of the of the closing mantra. But because it's important to have mantras, I went into a tirade about that last time. I'm going to recite it. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. While the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. We need a government of action that will fight for working families. We need a government of action that will fight for working families. We need a government of action that will fight for working families out of the movement to the masses, out of the movement to the masses, out of the movement to the masses, dare to struggle, dare to win, dare to struggle, dare to win. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression, but the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. Good night, everybody.